to me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me.
Ah! Uh -huh. 
your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, and their children, and their children. this morning it comes from Romans 12 1 and 2 uh, and it's the God's Word translation it says brothers and sisters in view of all we have just shared about God's compassion I encourage you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices dedicated to God and pleasing to him this kind of worship is appropriate for you don't become like the people of this world instead change the way you think then you will always be able to determine what God really wants what is good and pleasing and perfect my title this morning that God has given me for this message is called Altered, A Life Transformed at the Altar of God. You see, first I want to start out with the importance of the altar in this, this biblical context. Over and over again, we see the altar mentioned in the Bible. And the altar represented many, many things throughout Scripture. The altar represented a place of sacrifice. In Genesis 8 and 20, Noah built an, offer, or built an altar and offered burnt offerings to God after the flood. You don't have these scriptures, Melissa, so sorry. I just, I'm referencing them, but I, I don't have the actual scriptures. Uh, in Genesis 22, we read about Abraham and his willingness to sacrifice his son. And we'll talk more about this later. Altars represented a symbol of covenant and commitment. In Genesis 12 and 7, Abraham built an altar as a sign of his covenant with God regarding the land that God had promised him. Altars symbolized places of worship and thanksgiving. In Joshua 4, the Israelites built an altar to worship and to give thanks for God's faithfulness in bringing them into the promised land. Altars were, were also spiritual symbols. They were places where people sought forgiveness and their sacrificial offerings were their way to atone for their sin. 
Altars were places to encounter God. In Genesis 28 and 18, the altar at Bethel is where Jacob had the dream of the ladder to heaven. In the New Testament, the altar took on a more symbolic and spiritual meaning rather than a physical place. With Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice, we now offer ourselves as a living sacrifice on the altar as our offering to God. Altars were also places of community and unity. Altars served as a communal gathering place for the people of Israel where everyone came together to collectively worship and renew their commitment to God. So now that we've, we've talked about the importance of these altars in, in the Bible, but let's go through the definition of being altered, right? Now, most of you may have noticed I misspelled altar up here, or altered, in the way it's being used. Alter, A-L-T-E-R, is a verb, and that means to change or cause to change in character or composition, typically in a comparatively small but significant way. Now, this is the homonym of altar, which I have used, which is what we are scripturally talking about today. But I love a good play on words. You see, one typically goes to the altar, A-L-T-A-R, to be altered, A-L-T-E-R, by God. We already know to be altered means to be changed in a significant way, typically in character or composition. That was the definition we just read. And this process is completed through surrender, through transformation, and through renewal by worship and encounters with God, which we will cover all of in a few minutes. So, the significance of the altar, I'm going to go a little more in-depth into those and into the importance and the significance of, of why they had altars in the Bible. You see, altars were built all throughout the Old Testament, starting as early as Cain and Abel. They were giving offerings on their altar, and their offerings on the altar were ultimately what led to Cain killing his brother. There's a disagreement over it, and, and Cain's offerings weren't accepted the way Abel's were, and he got jealous. But, but we see Time and time again, altars being built for sacrifice, for worship, or simply to encounter God. Altars of sacrifice were built to often ask for forgiveness and to atone for one's sin. You would bring an offering uh, and burn it to atone for whatever sin you'd committed, right? And the tabernacle was a great example of an altar for this specific purpose. Israelites would bring their offerings and lay them on the altar of burnt offering as they entered into the temple. And this symbolized the sacrifice for their sins. Altars were also built as places of worship and thanksgiving. The altar of incense, also in the tabernacle, was used as a representation of the continual prayers and intercession of God's people. Noah built an altar for thanksgiving and worship after surviving the flood. Abraham built many altars all over Shechem, Bethel, Hebron, and Mount Moriah as places of personal worship and covenant. Isaac, following in Abraham's footsteps, rebuilt Abraham's altars to be able to worship at. Altars were also built as a place to encounter God or where someone had encountered God. Jacob built the altar at Bethel where he encountered God in a dream. Gideon built an altar where he lived after his encounter with the Lord. And his altar marked Gideon's call to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Elijah rebuilt the altar that had been torn down and offered a sacrifice to prove that Yahweh was the true God against the prophets of Baal. All these were, were different types of altars used throughout the Old Testament. But the altars in the New Testament, as we mentioned before, they became less of a physical thing and more of a symbolic or a spiritual concept. However, there was one very important altar, the cross. The cross could be viewed as the ultimate altar where Jesus offered himself as the perfect once-for-all sacrifice for all the sins of humanity. He sacrificed himself on that final altar and he paid the price for the cost of sin, which we know was death. This brought an end to the old sacrificial system and brought permanent atonement for our sins. Which brings us to our personal altars. You see, now we create altars whenever and wherever we need them. It allows us to meet with God without having to build a physical place to do so. Though we oftentimes call this space up here near the platform of the pulpit, we call it an altar. It's not the only altar. An altar is anywhere that you've dedicated and set aside as a sacred space. A space to sacrifice and ask for forgiveness. A space to worship and praise God. And a space to have an encounter with God. It's still used for the same purpose, but it's not always a physical, like that you built an altar. This space could be simply a closet at home, beside your bed, an office, a sunroom, a small section of your living room. Any space that you commune with God becomes an altar to God. 
You see, the altar, as we've seen, is a place of profound spiritual significance. Throughout the Bible, it represents more than just this physical structure, but it symbolizes sacrifice and covenant, worship, and divine encounter. At the altar, people offered sacrifices to atone for sin, express thanksgiving, and renew their commitments to God. And it was at the altar that lives were changed and destinies were altered as individuals and communities encountered the presence of the Almighty. But the altar is not just a relic of the past or an ancient symbol of worship. It holds a timeless truth that is just as relevant today as it was in the days of Abraham, Moses, and Elijah. The altar calls each of us to a place of deep personal surrender. It beckons us to lay down our lives as living sacrifices to experience the transforming power of God. And just as the physical altars in the Bible were places of profound spiritual encounters, today we are altered through surrender. When we fully submit our will, our desires, and our very lives to God, the act of surrender is the spiritual altar where true transformation occurs. It's where we exchange our old ways for God's ways, our weaknesses for His strength, and our brokenness for His wholeness. When we come to the altar of surrender, we invite God to alter our hearts, our minds, and our lives, aligning them with His perfect will. You see, the biggest step to being altered through surrender, which is our first step, is letting go of control. A lot of us here like to be in control. We like to know what's going on and have a say in everything. And I know that because I'm one of those people. I want to know everything and be able to give my input. I used to say I like being in HR uh, as my, my job, and it was perfect for me because I was always so nosy. I always wanted to be involved. I wanted to have a say. <clears throat> but in order to surrender, to fully surrender, you have to give up that control. God doesn't just want a part of you. He's not looking for just your hands or just your arms or just your leg. Definitely not just your mouth. He wants every part of you. He wants total and complete surrender. I was always taught growing up that we lift our hands when we pray and praise is a sign of surrender. Much like if a cop pulled a gun on you, what would you do? You raise your hands, right? I surrender, don't, don't shoot. It's the same concept. We lift our hands to God saying, God, I surrender to you. We have to fully surrender and be willing to submit to God's plan for our lives. God, whatever you have for me, your will, not mine. It's even in the Lord's Prayer, which is the example that was given to us of how to pray. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's about allowing God full control and trusting in Him, even when we can't always see His plan. And that's faith. That takes faith. Another step to being altered through surrender is to offer our lives as living sacrifices to God. If we go back to Romans 12 and 1, it says, Brothers and sisters, in view of all we have just shared about God's compassion, I encourage you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices dedicated to God and pleasing to Him. This kind of worship is appropriate for you. So I've heard that all my life, right? Offer your body as a living sacrifice. But what does that mean? It's a call to worship God, not just with rituals or, or outward acts or you know the outward appearance, but with every part of you, your actions, your thoughts, your desires, your lifestyle. It's an ongoing, everyday commitment. It means striving for holiness, living a life set apart from this world. It means living a life that's pleasing to God. Do you ever take a step back and, and just take a second and ask yourself, is my life pleasing to God? I think if we did, most of us probably wouldn't like our answer. It means denying yourself of your fleshly desires and pursuing God's will. It means serving others just as Christ served and sacrificing for all of humanity. Let's take a look at, at some biblical figures who were altered through surrender. If we look at Abraham, Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son on the altar. It would be a tough thing to do. If God asked me to sacrifice Bex, I'd have a very hard time doing that. But Abraham, not wanting to disobey, took Isaac, and they began the ascent up Mount Moriah, where he trusted God to provide, but was willing to do what was asked of him. Because of his surrender and his willingness to sacrifice his son, God blessed Abraham with descendants too numerous to count. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is another prime example of someone whose life was altered through surrender. 
Mary had a divine encounter with the angel Gabriel where she was told she would conceive and give birth to the Son of God. Mary could have had any type of response to this, as many of us probably would, but Mary's response to this was one of humility and surrender. Mary says in Luke 1.38, I am the Lord's servant. Let everything you've said happen to me. This response was an act of total surrender. Mary offered herself entirely to God's will without reservation, conditions, or hesitation. Paul is another great example, and you'll, you'll see Paul's name all throughout this, this uh, message. Paul is another great example of someone who was altered through surrender. His transformation from a persecutor of Christians to one of Jesus' greatest apostles illustrates to us how surrounding, uh, sur surrendering to God, sorry, it's a typo, I hate autocorrect. It illustrates to us how surrendering to God can change our lives. You see, Paul, the artist formerly known as Saul, was traveling through Damascus when he was blinded and confronted by God. Most of you have heard the story, but after his encounter, he fasted and he prayed, and God dramatically altered his life. He is completely transformed and became one of the most passionate and well-known apostles. Paul is the one who wrote the words we read earlier in Romans 12.1, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You see, we've seen that true surrender to God involves offering every part of ourselves, our thoughts, our actions, our desires, and our will as a living sacrifice. Just like Abraham, Mary, and Paul, when we fully surrender, we place our lives on God's altar, allowing Him to take control. This act of surrender is where the journey begins. It's where we lay down our old selves, open to whatever God has planned for us. But surrender is just the beginning. It's at this point of complete submission that God begins His transformative work in us. When we surrender, we give God permission to change us, to mold us, to reshape our lives according to His purpose. And it's through surrender that we become altered, and it's through transformation that we experience the full power of God's work in our lives. You see, as we surrender, God's transformative power begins to work within us. He doesn't simply leave us as we are. Instead, He begins to renew our minds, to change our hearts, and to align our lives with His will. This transformation is a continual process where God alters our character, our desires, and our very nature. And it's through this transformation that we grow into the likeness of Christ, becoming who God created us to be. So if we go back to, to Romans 12 and 2, it says, Don't become like the people of this world. Instead, change the way you think. Then you will always be able to determine what God really wants, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The New American Standard says it like this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what does that mean? We need to first surrender, then we need to be transformed. And the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed comes from the Greek word metamorpho, which is where we get the term metamorphosis. This means a fundamental change in former nature, such as a caterpillar to a butterfly. Everybody's seen that before, right? But in our context, we don't necessarily mean this, this exterior change. We mean an inner change, right? A change in our character, in our attitude, in our behavior to align us more closely with God's will. And unlike the caterpillar to a butterfly, this transformation is not a one-time event but rather an ongoing process. This is continual growth in holiness and spiritual maturity. What we're also talking about with this transformation is a mindset shift. We have to move away from our worldly thinking, our worldly values and priorities and perspectives, right? And adopt a mindset that is centered on God's truth. Renewing your mind means aligning your thoughts with God's thoughts and your will with God's will. And as your mind is renewed, you will gain discernment and wisdom that can only come from God. And though a lot of this transformation, I said, is inner change, this change should be reflected in our outer selves, in our character, in our attitudes, in our behaviors. It should be, be able to be seen in our outer selves. It should bring, bring about transformation in our relationships. There should be a shift away from any worldly aspects of our relationships, and instead a focus should be placed on the godliness of, and holiness of our relationships. 
When I say relationships, I don't necessarily just mean romantic. I mean friends, any type of business, rela- any relationships you have. You see, we should fo- focus on cultivating love within our relationships. Jesus is love, and Jesus should be the center point of all of our relationships. So love should grow and flourish with any, any relationship we, ha- we have. You see, cultivating love means showing those fruits of the Spirit within our relationships, right? Offering kindness and gentleness, understanding and peace. Forgiveness should also be at the forefront of any and all relationships. Offering forgiveness over resentment, hate and backbiting. You see, we've spoken plenty on unforgiveness. I've taught a message on it before. And the toll that it takes on you and your relationships. Both with others and with God. We should always seek unity in each and every one of our relationships. To be united and on the same page and and on the same uh, walk, right? We want to look at some biblical stories or biblical context here with, with transformation as well. The, the biggest one we see is Saul to Paul. I've already mentioned it once, but so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But from persecutor to apostle is a major transformation. It's probably, Paul's is probably the most well-known. If you think of a transformation in the Bible, that's probably the first one you think of. And for good reason. He is a prime example of following the steps to be altered. We can look at Peter. You see, though Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples... The night that Jesus was arrested, Peter found himself in an impossible predicament. Peter ultimately denied Christ three times that night. And afterwards, he realized his mistake. The Bible says he cried bitterly after realizing his failure. But God gave Peter a chance to redeem himself on the shores of Galilee. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his disciples, and he asked Peter three times, Do you love me? Each time, Peter affirms his love, and Jesus commands him to feed my sheep. Peter's transformation took him from a cowardly, guilty, and shameful disciple to a bold leader of the early church. Peter preached with authority, leading thousands of people to Christ. His restoration by Jesus demonstrates that even failure can be redeemed and used for God's purpose. We also look at the woman at the well, right? The Samaritan woman, likely ostracized by her community due to her past, came to the well in the heat of the day. And Jesus, despite social and cultural norms, which he never cared too much for, began to speak with her. You see, Jews and Samaritans didn't speak. They were, they were sworn enemies. But he began to talk to her and revealed her past to her and offered her living water. And after revealing himself as the Messiah, her transformation was near immediate. She left her water jar, which would symbolize leaving her old life behind, and she ran to town to tell everyone about Jesus. And her testimony led many other Samaritans to come to know Christ. She became one of the very first evangelists of God. You see, we've seen how profound transformations occur when lives are surrendered to God. How Saul became Paul. How Peter was restored. And how the Samaritan woman was redeemed. These stories show that when God transforms us, He doesn't just change our actions or our our circumstances. He alters our very identities, aligning us with His purpose. And this transformation sets the stage for something even deeper, a life marked by worship and ongoing encounters with God. But transformation is not the end of the journey. It's the beginning of a new way of living. As we are transformed, our response is to draw closer to God, to seek His presence and to worship Him with our whole hearts. Transformation opens the door to a life of continual worship and deeper encounters with God, where we experience His presence and power in new and profound ways. Now that we're transformed, our lives become a living sacrifice and worship becomes the natural outflow of our gratitude and devotion to God. Through worship, we encounter God's presence and these encounters further shape and refine us, drawing us closer to Him. You see, worship's not just an act, it's a lifestyle, a continual response to God's grace where we are altered again and again by His love and holiness. We can be altered through our worship and through encounters with God, right? But that involves true worship. And true worship can be found in John 4 and 24. It says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So let's break this down. To worship in spirit means worship that comes from the heart. It's not about the looks. It's not about you. It comes from deep inside of us. It's wholehearted. 
Your worship, you worship with your entire being, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And, excuse me, to worship in truth means to align with God's truth, to worship God as he truly is and following his word, which requires knowledge of his character, his will, and his works, which would require reading the Bible, right? You see, it's worship. To worship in truth is worship that's sincere and honest. It's not a front to look or act a certain way. It's not look at me and how I worship. It's genuine. It's honest worship sent up to God. Yeah. And through this true worship, when we begin to worship, to truly worship in spirit and truth, we can then begin to encounter God. When we encounter God, we begin to, to truly enter into and experience His presence. And in his presence, we can find grace. Grace is our covering over our sin, right? Over our lives. In his presence is where we find healing. Healing for our sickness. Healing for disease. Healing for anything going on in our lives. In his presence is where we find deliverance. If we're struggling with something. Something's uh, you know, on our back or something's plaguing us. We can have deliverance in God's presence. Anything else we may need comes from an all-powerful God when we enter into his presence and when we encounter God. There are many stories throughout the Bible of encounters with God, but I want to cover a few of them. First is Isaiah's vision. If we go to Isaiah 6 and 1, it says, In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and lofty throne, and the bottom of his robe filled the temple. Angels were standing above him, each had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They called to each other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the foundations of the doorposts and the temple filled with smoke. So I said, Oh no, I'm doomed. Every word that passes through my lips is sinful. I live among people with sinful lips. I have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the angels flew to me and in his hand was a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away, and your sin has been forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom will I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Isaiah has this powerful encounter with God. and In the midst of it, all he can see is his sinfulness. But with this live coal, an angel symbolically cleanses his lips and alters his life forever. He becomes commissioned as a prophet to speak God's word to Israel. If we look at Jacob, as I mentioned earlier, Jacob had an encounter with God in an altar. The night before he was to meet with Esau, who we know he feared because he had stolen his birthright. But it says he began to wrestle with a man that we find out later was God. And though overpowered, Jacob refuses to let go without a blessing. On this night, his name was changed to Israel, meaning he struggles with God. This encounter not only altered Jacob's physical being, says he left with a limp, but it also altered his spiritual identity and relationship with God. He emerged as a man with a new purpose and a deeper understanding of God. We've discussed Saul multiple times already, but Saul had a direct encounter with God. And Saul's encounter with God not only altered his beliefs and identity, but also his entire purpose and mission in life. Remember, he persecuted Christians, and God changed that entire mission, his entire purpose. You see, we've explored how these powerful encounters with God, like Isaiah's vision with Jacob's wrestling with God, with Saul's conversion, all these can alter our lives through deep, transformative worship and a personal experience of God's presence. These moments of divine encounter leave us changed with a renewed sense of purpose and identity and a new mission. But these encounters are not just about isolated experiences. They're meant to shape the way we live every day. You see, the transformation that begins in moments of worship and encounter is meant to continue throughout our lives. We're called not just to experience these altered moments, but to live out their implications in every aspect of our daily lives. The encounters we have with God should lead us to a life that is continually altered. Remember I said it's a process. It should be continual. A life fully surrendered to God marked by ongoing transformation and dedicated to his purposes. Living an altered life means taking the transformation that we've experienced in worship and encounters and allowing it to permeate every area of our existence. It's about making our whole life, our thoughts, our actions, our relationships, our decisions, all a living sacrifice to God. 
An altered life is one that continually seeks God's presence, that responds to his call and that reflects his character in all that we do. It's a life where the altar is not just a place we visit, but a way we live, daily offering ourselves to God in worship, obedience, and service. You see, in order to live an altered life, you have to surrender daily. Just as we have to repent and die to our flesh daily, we need to be surrendering our whole selves to God daily. We should be constantly asking, what would Jesus do, right? The old bracelet everybody wore. We need to practice yielding to God's will and what he has for our lives. Because I can promise you what God has is so much better than what you have planned for yourself. By daily surrendering our lives, we're saying to God, I trust you. I trust that you know what's best for me, and I'm giving you complete control. By our daily surrender, this will then allow us continuous transformation. Remember, like we said, uh, unlike the caterpillar, our transformation is continuous. We must be constantly changing and transforming to follow the will of God in our lives. You see, as the world changes, we must also change and adapt to not only set ourselves apart, but also to be able to reach the lost in this world. As we grow in Christ, becoming more spiritually mature, we may begin to notice relationships that don't fit into God's will anymore. And that's okay as long as you're following God's will. Sometimes relationships will fall apart or dissolve to make room for new God-ordained relationships. That's why we need to constantly be praying and be in God's word and continually transforming our lives. And lastly, with our new transformed lives, we should be impacting the world around us. They should be able to see the change and see the difference in our lives. Just as you can see the difference when a caterpillar changes to a butterfly, the world should be able to see the difference in our attitudes and our character and our behaviors. If the world doesn't see you as different, maybe you need to evaluate yourself and see if you're following God's will and growing in Christ. In closing, I just want to recap quickly. We need to be altered through surrender, which is to let go, to release control, and to submit to God's will and plan for your life. We need to be altered through transformation, which is to renew our thoughts and transform our relationships. We need to be altered through worship and through encounters with God. We need to worship in spirit and in truth and make sure that you're taking the time to encounter and experience Jesus Christ. And we need to live an altered life. Apply everything that we've talked about today. Daily surrender, continuous transformation, and making an impact to those around you. Part of your kingdom comes breaking into deep graves, calling every last address. I hear the sound of your love rushing in. Things that were dead are now breathing again. You're doing a new thing, doing a new thing. start right here Lord open my eyes go behind the scenes show me that there's more to you than what I see Lord open my heart break new ground is that I've known to the wonder of your dreams like the dew in the morning like the rain when it's pouring I'm finding peace when I know that you're giving me life fresh life you're doing a new day a part of your key i
Okay, cause here with you is where I'm changed.